What's up, Internet? It's Chris Krug. I'm checking in from Vancouver, and I got my buddy Kevin Kelly with me here. Say what's up, Kevin. Hi, Chris. I want to Kevin, catch up. Kevin's an old photographer buddy of mine. We met at Hollyhock on Cortez Island back in the day, and uh, he's got quite an interesting claim to fame. He wrote a book called Home Planet, or I should say maybe curated and published a book called Home Planet in the 70s. Kevin? Not that bad. 88, late, late, later part of 88 with a bunch of original photos from space of Earth, if taken by NASA and by the Soviet Cosmo program. And the foreword was written by Jacques Cousteau. Yeah, tell us a little about that, Kev. It was the most beautiful pictures of the Earth from space, accompanied by quotations from astronauts and cosmonauts, reflecting about what it meant to be human and experience the Earth and the moon space from space and uh, one of the things i've always been intrigued about your project sorry to cut you off is like the open source nature of it so you didn't make those photos did you i went to nasa i have a notion they were there i didn't even know for sure they were there and uh, it's a long story about that but anyway yeah i looked through every handheld picture out the window taken by astronauts and astronauts for the first mercury flight all, all the way past the book to 1999. And I looked through every one of those and curated them down to about 3,000 that I thought were pretty good, or would be good. And I had to cut those down to 150. And it was the biggest co-publication between a Soviet and American publisher. We ended up printing books in 11 languages simultaneously by one printer in Italy and the quotes were accompanied by the quotes were in the native language of the flyer if it was different than the language of the edition. It's amazing really. These photos are available to you because they were made with taxpayer dollars? They were hard to get. You go the only picture back then was the full moon, the full earth picture, the big Apollo picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so nobody had seen them. Most people hadn't seen any of these. And I was, it was, I was editing with, with the couple of women who were helping, we were editing them and going through them. And somebody said in the room, it sounds like you guys are having an orgy in there. Cause everybody was going, oh my God. Oh, you know, this stuff. And it was just, they're just awesome. They're just absolutely awesome. Those That's things. Incredible. Anyway, we put them in a big coffee table book and Cousteau to the fours and it was on the New York Times bestseller list for eight weeks or something. Yeah. When I tell your story, like almost everybody has, is familiar with the cover of that book and the iconic photos that you published there. It was kind of been done without Noetic Institute. And it was the astronauts and there's the Associated Space Explorers that was really done under their aegis. I took the idea to them. They already had an idea and we worked together. Anyway, enough of that. What brings us here together today is we've been on a bit of a exploration together. You and I have been having some chats about AI and sticking them on the internet and folks been following those along and figuring out what we're up to and stuff. And so I guess I'll just turn it over to you at this point, man. When we, thank you, Chris, when we talked last, you were just in my, from my view, we're just starting to use AI for your business. And you were telling us how, telling me how you were using it to uh, edit stuff, to search for stuff, to give you advice on how to look at all your I think doing life commercially, maybe personally too, and how to turn it into a kind of a business plan and how to edit that. And now it's been, like I say, maybe five months, however long it's been. What in the hell? How was that evolved? What you were just starting, it must, have, it must be changing. You're probably using AI a ton of ways now. And I'm interested in that progression. What have you done and how are you using it? How did you go? Oh, that's not so great. Maybe I should do it this way. What do you look? What are you learning there? How are you using it mostly? I'd like to get in later on and maybe another call about show us how you're using it. So sure. Just, okay. Sure. You're right, man. It's been moving at like a breakneck speed since we talked last. And I've definitely been like in the trenches, so to speak, uh, just running alongside all these different AI projects and trying to figure out what they're all about and, and share that with the world. Um, and so, yeah, man, I'm using it all the, all the time, every day now. I've definitely been working on developing what I call like an AI mindset. 
So it's like more than just the particular tools that I use or the techniques that I use, but I've been trying to think about how I can best integrate AI into my creative processes and my business processes and stuff. And so I've been really overhauling everything. I use it all day long, every day now. For a while, I was doing some business coaching with my friends' businesses. I developed a bit of a methodology where I would ask people to answer some questions into their audio recorder on their phone. And I would transcribe those and start to feed those into the AI and make some sense out of them and then return those recommendations back to them in the form of reports and stuff. And I've done that for myself. So a little bit more about that, what that means. So you got, you, you auto transcribe them and then you, and then AI would come back and say, this is the way they can organize their material as a business, as a business approach. Yeah. I might say something like, Hey, Kevin, tell me about your photography career and how you envision it, um, moving forward. I might ask you to record a 10 minute audio recording about that. Then I may use that transcription from that audio recording to go into chat GPT or in one of the other models and say, dear chat GPT, you are a business consultant and life coach. My friend is looking to reinvent himself as we move forward from into a new age of digital photography, read this transcript, make detailed notes, pull out the best quotes and give me a summary of what he has to say. And so It'll analyze that, return all those things I asked it to. And then we have some information that we can start making sense of. I can share that with you and we can workshop it together. And then we can take it to the next level and say, um, maybe I'll have you make three different recordings, three different topics. I've got these three different summaries and outlines. And then I might feed those outlines back into the AI and say, all right, based on our discussions with Kevin, use this information to generate new about pages, service pages, and contact pages for his website or something like that, and have it actually output the text. And one thing that people have been talking a lot about lately is the way that AI kind of writes like bullshit gobbledygook. It, it, a lot of times you can tell that something's written by AI by the way that it talks and stuff. And so I've been trying to hack around that and make it so you can't that it's uniquely my voice, that it sounds like me as the best I can. And so I've developed a couple of ways of doing that. I, I've written a personal style guide. I fed the AIs like, I don't know, 50 pages of my writings and had it build a writing style guide based on my previous writings. So now when I'm asking AI to write stuff for me, the first thing I feed it is my style guide. So it knows how I write and it knows how I speak from the outset. I took that concept and I went a little further and I also had to develop a perspectives and worldviews document. I, I talked to it about what I think and what I feel and my thoughts. And I also fed it a bunch of stuff from the past and I had it like generate a document that talks a little bit about how I see things and my philosophy, my core principles and my values. And so anytime I'm starting a new writing project with AI these days, I drop in my style guide, I drop in my values document. And then I start to ask it for information. And AI helped you refine and develop your styles guide and your personal values guide as well. Yeah. It's based on my original content. It's based on if I talk, if I give a one hour keynote and that is uh, recorded on YouTube and I can get a transcription out of that, I can feed it. I can feed that keynote transcript into the AI and I can say, based on how I talk in this video, write me a writing style guide or based on what you hear in this video determine my values, objectives, and purpose. How well does it do that in your view? (laughs) Better than I could in five minutes. It gets it about 90% accurate or maybe even better accurate enough that it's definitely usable and I can just tweak it. It's very accurate. One of the things it's best at is like finding patterns in large blocks of text. Like this week at work, I used it for an exercise where we were doing a branding exercise and everyone on the team came up with like five brand values, things they thought our, the voice of our brand was. And everyone's words were different. We have 10 people. Each one has five different values. There's some overlap. And to really mm, coordinate and make sense of those things is a hard thing for a human to do. But it's amazing when I fed everyone's different values into the AIs and then asked it to make sense of the overlaps and the discrepancies between those two things. 
really good at comparing stuff. So, and collating information. And so it's, it's quite incredible how accurate it is. That's interesting. Years ago, I've had bro broken up with somebody. I just thought I'll never meet anybody like that again. My dating life is over. When I got this invite from eHarmony and I thought, all right, show me. All right, we'll see. So I, it took something like two hours to fill this thing out. Are you the more like this or more like, this? and when I do those things, I go, yeah, I'm like that, but then I'm like that. And, and I think the profile it made for me was, yeah, it sounds like it, it sounds like it's excellent. It's sorting through stuff like that. It's really good. And, and the more you tune it and tweak it, the better it will get, the more original content that you can feed it, the better off you are. And the difference in the writing outputs between just asking it to write you something and asking it to write you something with your style guide and perspective worldview fed into it, the results are completely different. It's got my voice nailed. Sometimes it's a little hyperbolic, like it, it takes my idioms and idiosyncrasies and takes them to an extreme. But depending on the audience I'm writing for, I can always tone it down, make it a little more straightforward, formalize my language. And it's pretty easy to nudge it in the right direction. I've got a couple of friends who I'm going to introduce to this on how, how much time and effort and work does it take? A lot less than it would if you were going to do this stuff on your own. Um, but it empowers me to do things I wouldn't have done otherwise, man. In the last five months, I have overhauled like everything. I've started a podcast, a video blog, an email newsletter. I've started blogging again, like it's 2005, written new bios, short form and long form bios. I've built a new services page for my website. It's not that it just makes things more efficient. It's that it allows me to do stuff that I, I hadn't been doing before. And that feels like creativity to me. It yeah. feels like if I'm one of my friends listening to this and going, how do I do this? Is it something I can download and do, or do I have to go read all the stuff that Chris did and invent all these things and write all the code and was there plug and play or a great place for people to start. If they're interested in more of like the personal branding area is like, just take your bio from your about page and copy it in GPT and say, update my bio for me <laughs> and then paste the bio in and see what it comes back with or say here's my long form bio write a short form one or say here's a short form bio write a long form one and you'll start to get an idea based on its outputs um um what it's capable of you know you could say write a formal version of this or write it as a here's my bio write a feature length biography article about me and then you can start there to you're more familiar with your own body of work than you are almost anything else. So it's a great place to test the waters with the AI, but I would just start cutting, pasting stuff into it and, and see what you get back. You have to do a show and tell at some point on that. I don't think this call, how do you train? Tell me how you're getting your transcriptions. I'm doing them a couple ways. <laughs> I've downloaded the chat GPT iPhone app, um, yeah. which is incredible. It's literally just a prompt in a browser window and it uses the microphone so I can literally like talk to it. Hey, chat GPT. I'm here on doing a podcast with my buddy, Kevin Kelly, and he wants me to tell him more about the best practices when it comes to dictating in your phone to AI. And it will return some results. I got to put my glasses on here. I use auto dictate a lot on the iPhone and it sucks. Oh, what's the name of that program? The cool. voice recorder app on phones now does auto transcription. So I just use the voice memo app. I push the big red button, I talk at it. And when it's done, there's a transcription there waiting for me. And then all these tools are integrating transcription services. One of the things AI is the best at, whether it's like YouTube, or Otter AI, or man, the podcasting tool I'm using these days, Kevin, it would really blow your mind. It's called Descript. And okay, so I put my video in or I put my audio file in and boom, it generates a, a text-based transcript. And how then how it, accurate is that? Dude, generally. it's fucking accurate, man. It's 99% accurate. And it, and it says right at the top, would you like me to remove filler words? 
And you're like, yeah. And so it goes through and it says, the filler words I usually look for are ums, buts, and uhs, or something like that. What other filler words would you like me to add? And I have a couple. I say the word like all the time. I say the word just. I minimize things by putting the adjective little. Check out this little project I'm involved with and stuff like that. So anyway, I, I put these words in and boom. It goes through the whole hour long podcast, identifies those words and removes them. And then it shows you what you're going to remove. Yeah, but it shows you like in the word document form, in the transcript form, it highlights all the ums in the document, and say remove, but then it goes back to the audio and the video file and removes it from the video and from the audio and splices together. So you have like seamless. Really? Oh yeah. man, dude. Kevin, well, how does that sound though when you take the because you got a flow and you you don't see where it's, it's man? Out. It sounds like an interview on sixty minutes. You don't realize that everything you watch on TV, everything you've ever ingested via the mainstream media, is super chopped up and cut together and edited. Man, it's very you never see raw footage. This but is it, audio, not video, right? It's I mean, audio. What, it's audio and video, Kevin. It's what happened? You, well, you're sitting there talking and gesturing, and you take out fuck. And then my hand went like that. Does it patch that stuff in a way that it doesn't show? Okay. So if you're making big gestures, it could jump from a gesture frame to a non-gesture frame. But in terms of all the mouth stuff in your face, yeah. it, it, it splices them together so you don't notice the cuts and the edits. And so in normal filmmaking, what you would do if I was waving my hands around and then you cut out a swear word and it jumped to me without my hands moving around. You would just fill that one cut with a piece of B-roll. You would just take one shot of something that's not my face. You'd cut to that for a second and then you'd, you'd cut back or whatever to hide it. But you would, you don't need to do that, man. It's remarkable. Program is doing this? Yeah, dude. And it's I can have the script, it's called. And I, the way I've been editing my podcast, I spent an hour and a half in the bathtub this morning editing a recent podcast. And I literally go through the text-based transcription and start to delete and edit the parts I don't want. And then you know what else I do, Kev? Remember I told you I was building a voice clone audio model? My voice clone has gotten pretty good. So not only can I remove via a text-based transcript the parts of the audio and video that I want out, but then I can insert things that I didn't actually even say into the audio using my voice clone. So I can literally type a transition. And up next we have... And it will, in my voice clone model, output a little audio file that says, in, and next we have, and then it will seamlessly cut that into my interview with you that I have there or something like that. And you can't tell the difference between the part that's my voice and not my voice. What's the purpose? What's to use? What do you want a voice clone for? What's that about? Like I just said, I can use it in the audio editing process to string together things I've said with a transition of something that I didn't actually say. It's very useful in the audio editing process to be able to make yourself say something that you didn't actually say. When um, you left um, out in a podcast or something, you go, damn, I should have said that and I didn't say it. It needed amplification, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. Or even just little words here and there. As I'm deleting sections and making this a tight edit, sometimes like the context or the tone is just, if I had one word in there, like an and or a the or a whatever, it, the sentence would make more sense. And so I can literally just type T-H-E and in my voice, a the will be inserted into that string. And it's, it's really incredible. And then I can use it for longer form stuff too. Like if I wanted to, I could type out a three paragraph intro and have my voice clone read that intro, but I found it would be better for myself to just read it in my real voice and then to supplement it with the voice clone in places that it's missing. And the value of the voice clone is it's, will, in theory, will be easier to insert these things than you going back in and speaking them and inserting them that way. Yeah, there's some things that it just doesn't make sense to make a recording of yeah there's all sorts and yeah there's all sorts of ways to use the audio clone in audio and podcast editing is it only for editing i had a sense that you, that you had multiple uses for this i do have multiple uses 
I was like having chat GPT generate poetry. And then I was reading, having my voice clone read that poetry in my voice. But that was mostly as a way to test the model to see how close it was getting to being able to accurately imitate my voice or whatever. But yeah, dude, I could like programmatically have chat GPT or AI in general harvest me all the best photography headlines of the day feed that via text into my voice clone, have my voice clone read those headlines as news stories, and then publish that as a podcast without any human involvement if I wanted to. Maybe if you were dating somebody, you could maybe get it to make you sound like Barry White. Yeah, you absolutely could. This tool that I use is called Eleven Labs. And I highly recommend you checking it out. It's very fascinating. Not only can you use your own voice, but people like me can submit my voice to the, I don't know, voice library or whatever. And so you can use lots of other people's voices too. They got everything from like thug to valley girl. You just download these different voices and you could have a, what sounds like a podcast with multiple hosts on it. And it could all just be robots. <laughs> so somebody, I come along, it's been five months. You've got all, all this work we've done for like five months doing this stuff you've been learning practicing practicing and playing with it mm -hmm. how long would it take me how much work and effort would it take me to get at least fairly functional i got a friend who's i my friends are really accomplished like dugan who we were talking about yeah and he's just ready to dive into this stuff Are there Will it take him just a couple of weeks to get going, get caught, kind of caught up with where you are? Is it going to take him six months like you or? Okay. So it's like a tool fold answer. It's so exciting right now because these tools are becoming more and more easy to use and like more and more democratized. They're showing up in Gmail and they're showing up in like the Microsoft search engine. These companies are making really big moves to integrate these new AI tools into their offerings. Some people would say too big of moves, they're moving too quickly and maybe not thinking things all the way through. But so in terms of the tools, they're getting more powerful and easier to use than ever. So in some ways you didn't necessarily miss the boat by not being into it six months ago. However, more than the tools and the techniques, it's really about developing this AI mindset, understanding how you can use this stuff and what it's good at and what it's not good at. And I do think that takes some time to understand. And while it can start giving you useful stuff right away, I'd encourage like getting up to speed and run along inside of it as quickly as you can so that you can really start to understand how it works and, uh, and put it to work for you. Okay. Here's a workshop for you and, or something to do. What is what let's talk about. What is the AI mindset? Sure. Let's break uh, down the AI mindset. It's off the cuff. Yeah. I, it changes the way I interact with my machine, my computer, the internet and people around me. And so just understanding, like I said, like what it's good at and what it's not good at places to use it. It really can. <laughs> so last weekend I was at a hackathon a public transportation hackathon called Hack CT. And I was a mentor for the different groups there and I was the photographer of the event. But I got really inspired during the, the opening remarks. There was the guys from GitHub there, the CEO and the CEO, Thomas and Kyle. And they were talking about how in the future, the short-term future, like 80% of all code and software is going to be written by AIs. And I was like, well, that sounds pretty good to me because I'm not much of a developer. I, I'm not much of a coder. And they were talking about no code hacking and stuff. And I was like, all right, the time is now. So I used ChatGPT's advanced code analyzer to build an AI powered chatbot for public transportation. It's built in HTML, but also in Python and in Flutter and Socket OS. And these are like highly technical programming languages that I have not been trained on. But through working with ChatGPT, I was able to generate code, refactor the code. There was even a point at which I was trying to debug the, the part of the app that serves up the mobile version of the app. And I was stuck and I asked someone for help and they said, oh, you chose Dart. But if you would have chose 
React Native, I could help you. I'm um, sorry, I can't help you. And I was like, all right, I should be able to get AI to figure out how to refactor this whole code base and take the Dart part out and put the React Native part in. And so I changed the app midstream, refactored all the code base, integrated socket.io and React Native. And then Ari was able to help me do all the debugging or whatever. And even to the point of asking AI how to use GitHub, how to commit my code to the open source repository, how to do I used the chat GPT to document the code that I wrote so that other developers that want to download it and use it have all the documentation in line there and stuff. And so when I talk about developing an AI mindset, truly understanding the possibilities that are there with it and starting to experiment with which of those things feel good and are impactful in your life and in your career. Okay. That's a general oversense of uh, overview of how you use it. Specifically, that's there's more depth in the, the AI mindset. So as part of it is understanding what it can do for you. And there are a lot of different facets of what it can do for you. If sure. you have to know what those are, so you <laughs> see the wheels turning. Yeah. So, have you been tinkering with it much? No, I haven't had, I've been dealing with building, building your projects. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, as a couple, well, you yeah, remember I, that I, time that you sent me a legal letter one time and you needed a response to it or whatever. That was, and that was a pretty interesting use of it. I was able to turn some stuff around for you. Yeah. We used, I had, I was pissed off about something and, and was saying, hey, come on, wait a minute, and writing a letter. I use it that way all the time, man. Like sometimes people make, they write things on the internet that need response, but I don't want to respond in kind. And so I write my true response and then I take it into AI and I'm like, yo, help me say this in like a diplomatic and peaceful. We had, and, and you said just, I, and I, you said, yeah. I said, could you run this by through a, a chat GDP, please? And you said, and you said, yeah, yeah, just send it to me. I said, oh, no, it's not ready yet. I got to, it's got too much emotional stuff and it's not quite clear. And no, I'll do it. Let me, I got to go through it again. And, and you said, no, just send it, just send it. And I sent it to you and it was fucking amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty incredible, man. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It wasn't perfect because there was stuff I had in it that were, what well, wasn't clear. And it, yeah. that, that stuff that wasn't clear, that was convoluted it didn't totally sort out but it could have been easily edited and and sorted but here's one that might help okay i've been using this new tool for the last couple of weeks called po p o e and i've mentioned it on a couple podcasts and stuff but it's essentially like a dashboard that allows you access into a bunch of different ais google has a model called palm meta and facebook have a model called llama there's chat gpt which you've heard of there's Anthropic's version of Claude. There's all these different AIs that are floating around. There's Midjourney and Dolly and all the rest, right? So Poe consolidates all those different AIs into one interface. So I can ask the same question or prompt the AI with the same prompt across multiple different models. And I get different results based on the model and I can start to learn which ones are better at which things. So ChatGPT is really good at writing code, whereas Claude is really good at creative writing. The output of its creative writing is way better than ChatGPT. I have used the Poe tool to start sending different information to different AIs and start to get a good feel for what the different ones are good at. Okay, this is a good place to maybe stop this. We have about four minutes. Can you tell us, tell me about the server? What's the, what does the, your... What does your Discord server, what's it there for? What sure. does it do? How many people you got on it now? Sure. Discord is a lot like Slack. It's just a place for teams or groups to share information and collaborate and chat. It comes out of the video game world. I set up, when I was very first learning Midjourney, which is a text to image based AI where you type some words and it sends back pictures. When I was first learning Midjourney, it takes place on Discord. The only way to interact with it is on Discord. 
So I went to the Mid Journey Discord, and it's a chaotic spaceport of all sorts of. There's literally thousands of people. It's, it's, if you're not familiar with Discord and you're not familiar with AI, it's a very confusing place to be. I decided, okay, I want to do this, but I want to do it in a semi-private environment. So I created my own Discord channel and I installed the Mid Journey bot on it. And then I started to invite my friends to that place. And instead of making images on the Mid Journey Discord server, they can now make it on mine and we could learn together or whatever. And so over time, that has turned into a bit of a, a forum and chat room and collaboration space that's got, I don't know, 250 people on it. It's not super active. There's not like 100 messages a day. Sometimes there's 100 messages, but sometimes there's not. And it's a mix of people sharing links and asking questions, uh, making jokes, sharing insights. And then there's another channel where people are generating images and prompting mid-journey an events channel and like a place to an audio chat channel, a video chat channel, a place to hang out and talk to people and share and stuff. And so, yeah, it's just a private little corner of the internet where a bunch of creative geeks are hanging out and trying to figure this stuff out together. It's very easy. It's very easy to use. I find they're just a couple sections. Your airlock is where people talk. It's a real pleasure to have you there, man. If in nothing else, it's like a choir of different voices and perspectives who are all trying to crack the same nut together. And yeah, it's, it's, it feels supportive and empowering. I, I like it. I tell people my uh, VCR is still bleaking 12 midnight. I, I'm not that uh, digitally astute. And it, it's quite easy to navigate that. And there's you put most of your podcasts on there and people put in other things that they see. And it's very easy to navigate through it. And a really good learning place. I wish we could. I should buy the fucking pro version of Zoom, Kevin, so we can make these things a little bit longer. I'm not really ready to go yet. There you go. Anyway, Chris, this is very interesting. So where, where are you going now with this? What's your learning curve? You got a minute and 20 seconds or so. Mine says I got three and a half, four and a half minutes. Oh, man. I'm trying to learn better podcast and video editing production techniques. Mostly I've been doing these one take things or whatever, but I'm trying to take it to the next level and make my podcast sound more like the stuff that you um, are familiar with and stuff. And yeah, I'm growing the email newsletter and the discord channel, just immersing myself in the AIs and then trying to share it with the world. And the server, anything? New going on there? Anything real cutting edge on AI that's exciting that you're going to change things for us? Just yesterday, Microsoft announced that they're going to relaunch Bing and relaunch everything on, at Microsoft under this new AI everything, one ring to rule them all brand. And that's pretty intriguing. They're really taking it to the next level, and I expect to see other people like Meta and Google do the same. So there's been a lot of banter about that. Oh, one, one big thing is OpenAI has their own text to image generation model called Dolly and Dolly three is released and it's integrated into chat GPT before you used to have to, you had your text to text AIs and your text to image AIs and they were separate. And the one that was good was mid journey and you had to go to discord to do it, which was a pretty high barrier of entry to a lot of people. That's not what it's like anymore. Now you can do image prompting inside chat GPT natively with an even more powerful model. And uh, it's going to make it very accessible to a lot of people. It's going to be very interesting. And the prompting is different too. The vocabulary is different. The way you talk to it to get what you want is quite a bit different. And so I'm experimenting with that right now as well. And we uh, prompt animation or just still images. Yeah, you can prompt animation and video. If you want to prompt moving images, check out runway.ai. It's incredible, man. You can take stills of anything, real things or AI generated things, and you can turn them into clips. It's amazing. Yeah. And there's other animation tools as well. 3D model, you can make 3D models. There's a new logo one that came out, text to logo prompting. Yeah. Which one is that? It's called idea, Ideogram. I-D-E-O-G-R-A-M dot A-I. All right. Incredible. Not only does it make 
not only does it make the picture, but it puts words in it too, which is something that uh, Mid Journey and Dolly hadn't been proficient at up until now. Let's do this again. We got any time left on this or? No, nah, not really. I think we got about a minute here. And uh, yeah, man, I'm always happy to talk to you about this stuff. I love sharing it with the world and I appreciate you bringing all your friends on into the server and being a, a sentinel and translating all this uh, geeky stuff to folks who are intrigued but don't know where to jump in. Thank you, Chris. It's an interesting world. Yeah, man. It's my pleasure. All right. Thanks. Love you lots, Kevin. Talk soon, bud.